Today we're going to do one of the, um, uh, how should I say this, most impressive musicians uh, in the history of jazz. He distinguished himself by playing an unusual instrument. Well, not unusual, but one that we don't really look at as a solo instrument, the baritone saxophone. Uh, born in 1927 as uh, Gerald Joseph Mulligan. Uh, too many words. His uh, friend Shorten suggests Jerry Mulligan with a G, uh, like Gerald. And then later on, they just called him J. Rue, just to, you know, make it easy for everybody. J. Rue. Now, J. Rue uh, started out in a family of, you know, normal family, you know, four or five kids, mom and dad. Both uh, parents were uh, immigrants. Uh, or at least uh, first generation Americans. Um, father was from, uh, women from Delaware, mother was from Philadelphia. Their father was an engineer. So as a result, uh, the family traveled a bit. Although uh, Jerry was born uh, in Queens, New York, uh, the father soon found himself moving to the little town of Marion, Ohio. Uh, to work with a uh, electrical company, a power company. And he stayed there for a number of years, and uh, mom needed a little help uh, with the kids. So she hired this African-American woman named Lily Rose. And as time went by, uh, Mrs. Rose uh, formed an affinity and an affection for the little mulligan, Jerry. And he started hanging out at her house. And this was his first glimpse into the other side of the track, black life, African-American life, and jazz. Because she had to play a player piano in her house, and she had everybody from Art Tatum to uh, Fats and everyone else on that player piano, and he got to hear all that music, and he was just enthralled by it. Plus, in those days, we were still very much in segregation. We're talking about probably 1931, 32, somewhere in there. And uh, traveling musicians uh, normally had a difficult time finding hotels, especially in a place like Marion, Ohio. <laughs> that would have been really interesting, even today. Um, and uh, so Miss Rose would take musicians into her house as boarders as they traveled through. So young uh, Jerry got to uh, meet and greet a few traveling musicians from uh, Basie's band, Ellington's band, and other lesser groups. And uh, he became e e infatuated with the music and the people, and this infatuation that he gained from uh, Little Rose would follow him for the rest of his life. Well, soon the family pulled up again, and they left uh, Marion, but Marion never left him. And as he continued to move from one place to another place, he ended up uh, in Pennsylvania, um, uh, in the Harrisburg area, actually in Reading, and uh, started school there, which is, you know, right hour from Philadelphia, I guess. And uh, he, um, at one point, was uh, learning to play the clarinet and uh, starting to experiment with sounds. And uh, very early on, he decided he wanted to write music. Um, he ended up, at some point, in a Catholic school and he wanted to write an arrangement for a little Catholic school band. And he chose a tune called Lover. It was a great arrangement, so we're told. But of course, when the nuns discovered an arrangement with the title Lover in a Catholic school, oh, they confiscated it. And that, uh, <laughs> that arrangement never did see the last day again. Matter of fact, all this saw was uh, a trash can. But that did not deter him. He kept on with his ranging aspirations. And uh, sometime in his senior year, uh, he actually dropped out of school to start to write arrangements for the band uh, at uh, the local radio station. And uh, they were happy to get his arrangements because they were fresh. And this started his career, not so much uh, as a player, but as an arranger. He uh, went from the clarinet to the saxophone 
And eventually, although he played the soprano and all the other saxes, he settled on the baritone saxophone as his voice. And uh, that was a very, very uh, informative move on his part because he pretty much dominated uh, all the jazz poles. Uh, matter of fact, uh, he has the incredible uh, record of winning 41 consecutive downbeat jazz polls for best baritone saxophone player. I think it went from like 1953 to 1995. No one ever rivaled him. You're talking baritone sax, you're talking Jerry Mulligan. As he continues as a young man, however, his arranging kept moving him from place to place, uh, Thornhill's band and uh, moving to New York and working with some really fine orchestras and orchestrations, working with Gene Krupa's band, uh, writing a great arrangement of one of my uh, t tunes, a pivotal tune in my life, Between the Devil and the Deep Blue Sea, which got him recognized uh, in the New York area and in the jazz world. And so now his stock is going up as an arranger and as a player as well. Um, Fast forward a few years in New York, uh, he's hanging out with Gil Evans and other guys of um, uh, like mind who are interested in a music that is not as bombastic as bebop uh, happens to be. This is the late 40s, 48, 49, somewhere in there. And they're all gathering over there at Gil's uh, home. Gil is another arranger, so he's learning from Gil and he's also participating in these ensembles. And it's an unusual ensemble because they have a tuba player and a uh, French horn player. And uh, before you know it, they've got Miles Davis. And they have a nine piece group called the Miles Davis Nornette, which recorded music in 48, 49. And they were released as a few singles, but this was not very popular music. Uh, even when uh, they were playing uh, at the Roost, you've heard me talk about the Royal Roost, uh, not much of an audience came, and uh, most of the jazz musicians who were into the hot uh, East Coast jazz were like, oh, no, man, that stuff ain't got no emotion, man. Them cats don't even use vibrato. I don't know what Miles is doing. Uh, no, we don't like this. Well, a few years later, that music, Seven to eight years later, it released on a album called Birth of the Cool. And so what is known as West Coast Jazz or Cool Jazz was actually born in New York with the assistance of Mr. Miles Davis. Now that Nornette only played uh, a two week gig at uh, the Roost, that was it. Uh, maybe a few gigs later uh, as a kind of a regrouping but the group was short-lived. But Jerry did some writing, Gil did some writing, and Jerry played, and once again, being associated with Miles Davis, his stock is rising and rising and rising. Uh, he ends up uh, getting another arranging gig uh, with Stan Kenton this time, and he's out on the West Coast, and that's all going very, very well, and he's going to jam sessions at a place called The Hag, just a little, uh, a uh, small jazz club, and in that club he meets a, a young uh, Midwestern trumpet player uh, named Chet Baker. They became friends, and before you know it, they have one of the pivotal quartets uh, of all time. Uh, trumpet, baritone sax, bass and drums, no piano. And Jerry is writing a lot of the arrangements. Very early on, he had this contrapuntal style where he liked to take one line and put it on top of another line so you have a conversation between the melody and a counter line. He sometimes would use uh, improvisational lines that Charlie Parker had uh, created as a counter line to more established melodies. Very creative guy and uh, most certainly an innovator in the area of arranging. Well, this went to a very high level in that small uh, quartet because he and uh, Chet kind of weave in out of each other's lines, kind of like group improvisation that you would have had in the very beginnings of jazz in the early New Orleans tradition. 
Uh, this thing worked very, very well commercially and artistically, high reviews to this very day. Uh, these are considered some of the most important uh, albums, especially when you consider the growth of what they call cool jazz or West Coast jazz. Um, Jerry did develop some trouble with substance abuse, was arrested, went to jail. Uh, when he came out, Chet had been on his own. He had to find his own way. By the time Jerry came out of jail and wanted to put the quartet back together, Chet Baker's uh, stock had risen, and he could not financially afford to go back to a group with Jerry Mullen. So they split up, and that was the end of that great experiment. Back in New York, uh, Jerry goes, playing with this person, that person, recording this thing, that thing, recording the first albums under his name uh, in the uh, late 50s, early 60s, and continuing to be this great creative spirit um, as a arranger and musician. Played with everybody from Louis Armstrong, uh, Billy Eckstein, uh, my God, uh, Billy Holiday, uh, Dizzy Gillespie, uh, you name them, and Jerry Mullen played with them. But he always had this classical training. And in New York, he even started taking classical piano to refine his skills, because although he was a great sax player, a clarinet player, a ranger, he was also a great pianist. And in later years, uh, he would play piano in some of his piano-less groups. He wouldn't hire a piano player, but he would play piano behind a solo or something like that. And that actually had started with the uh, Chet Baker group uh, to a small degree. Uh, so this guy was always on the move trying to improve himself, trying to improve himself. In later years, uh, he got into writing scores for TV and movie. He moved into classical music, did a lot of collaborations with people like Andre Previn, uh, wrote for Cincinnati Orchestra, the LA, uh, some of the finest orchestras uh, in the country, uh, did a lot of work in Europe as well with orchestral music as well uh, as jazz. And then he turned to academia. He was a Duke Ellison Fellow at uh, Yale University. Did I say that he had 41 consecutive wins as the most outstanding baritone sax player by Downbeat? Yeah. He also has a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Grammy. He also has a Instrumental Performance Award for the Grammy. Um, he also uh, has had awards from around the world, both as a player as a composer, and as an arranger. Jerry Mulligan was a total deal. His style on the horn was very reminiscent of Prez's style. Oh yeah, he liked that smooth, clear tone and those beautiful, beautiful lines. Lester Young would have been very, very proud of how Jerry Mulligan took his style and applied it to the baritone sax. So here we got a guy that moved around all over the country and yet pursued this music. The bug hit him early in Marion, Ohio, when he was just a little something, and it continued to grow throughout his entire life, and he served the cause of music in every arena you can name, the concert hall, the sound stage, festivals, small jazz clubs, recording studios, jam sessions with the best of the best, you name it, Jerry Mulligan was there. So we say, Jero, thank you for shining your light on the jazz world. And that's my story, and I'm sticking to it.